Hello, my name's Will. Um, I'm 17 years old and I'm a politics student at the King's School Canterbury. Um, in this interview series, um, organised by Rusi and NATO, King's School students are interviewing NATO officials to learn more about what NATO does and what it's all about 30 years after the Cold War's ended. Um, so following on from two excellent previous interviews in the last couple of weeks, um, I'll be finding out from Bettina Kadenbach, uh, NATO's Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs and Security Policy, all about the organisations, both about um, a former and ongoing security partnership projects in the decades since the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. Um, so hello, Mrs. Kadenbach. Um, don't have long. Uh, my first question is, um, so 14 of the original Partnership for Peace members um, have now become fully fledged NATO member states in their own right. Um, do you think it's likely that we'll see another country do the same in the near future? And if so, who? Um, hello to everybody and thank you for inviting me and for giving me the chance to explain a little bit about what we are doing and in particular about our partnership programs. Yes, NATO's door is open. It remains open. This is already enshrined in the Washington Treaty, which is our founding document. We believe that enlargement has been a success historically. Such successive rounds of enlargement have, have increased stability and prosperity in Europe. To join NATO, countries are expected to respect the values of NATO and to meet strict political, economic and military criteria. So North Macedonia was the latest country to join the alliance in March. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia and Ukraine aspire to NATO membership. All three countries have already a deep and political cooperation um, with the Alliance, which is part of our cooperative uh, security framework. Um, when, if you ask the question about when they will join, I can't tell you that because uh, the criteria have to be met. And then, as you probably know, the Alliance has to have consensus on this uh, to take that step. Um, there's a Russian delegation at the NATO headquarters in Brussels. Um, why is this and how does that work? Well, there is a mission of the Russian Federation to NATO, but they do not have premises in this headquarters. Russia established a diplomatic mission to NATO in 1998 to facilitate regular contacts and cooperation. And before uh, 2014, NATO and Russia were working on a number of practical cooperation under the NATO-Russia Council. Uh, so NATO uh, Russian diplomats and military staff were present at NATO on a regular basis. In April 2014, NATO suspended practical civilian and military cooperation with Russia in response to the illegal annexation of, of Crimea. Um, although Russia has not sent an ambassador to NATO since 2018, Russia continues to have staff present in that Russian mission to NATO. NATO is committed to continuing the political dialogue with Russia at the level of ambassadors or above. In the NATO-Russia Council, we have already held 10 NRC meetings since 2016, in which the Russian ambassador or the charge to NATO and the Russian military representative to NATO have participated and then supported by their staff, of course. And we will um, hopefully be able to continue this practice. And whilst we mention the frozen conflicts ongoing in Ukraine and Russia's provocations in the Baltic, um, so as Russia's trying to expand their borders into foreign territory, what can NATO do to help countries such as Ukraine and Georgia? Well, let me first say that I wouldn't really call the conflict in eastern Ukraine frozen. This year, once again, we have witnessed quite a few casualties. Um, our policy towards Russia is very clear. Following Russia's illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea, NATO suspended, as I said, all practical civilian and military cooperation with Russia. Our current policy on Russia consists, consists of strengthening the deterrence and defense capabilities of the alliance, but still remaining open to political dialogue. Military channels of communications remain open to promote predictability and transparency, and in particular to reduce risks. The future of our relationship with Russia is contingent on a clear constructive change in Russia's action that demonstrates compliance with international law and its international obligations and responsibilities. And um, through these channels, through this, we hope to, to help um, to help, well, to help make these conflicts, well, to help solve the conflicts. 
Um, Sweden and Finland, uh, they're not NATO members, but they are close allies. So would NATO support them in a crisis? Well, um, Sweden and Finland are very close partners of NATO, but they are not allies. The Washington Treaty, including Article 5, applies only to NATO members. At the same time, NATO, Finland and Sweden work extremely closely together. We share the same values, recognize the same security challenges, and we have highly interoperable forces. So I would have to say that it is very difficult to imagine a security crisis in the Baltics in which NATO, Sweden and Finland would not work very closely together. Um, earlier this year, we saw tensions dramatically arise between um, Iran and the United States in the Persian Gulf. Um, had tensions escalated further, what would be the next steps for NATO? Well, as you know, um, NATO called for restraint and de-escalation following the rise in tensions. The Secretary General condemned the Iranian missile attack on coalition forces in Iraq. Allies met regularly during that period and my, myself, I personally liaised, liaised with ambassadors um, of our partner countries in the Gulf. And then thankfully tensions receded later. Any role, any expanded role of NATO would have to be discussed at the North Atlantic Council and it would require consensus among all allies that actions have to be taken. Um, there's a distinct lack of um, NATO partners in the South China Sea area, which is a particular worry as China asserts herself ever more in that region on territory that isn't um, hers. Um, do you think that NATO needs more and better allies in that region? Well, NATO has fantastic um, partners in that region. Um, we have a long-standing dialogue and partnership uh, with uh, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, New Zealand. The challenges confronting the Euro-Atlantic and the Asia-Pacific regions are more and more very similar in nature. So our partnerships enable us to discuss the relevant developments in the Asia-Pacific region because that contributes to our nature's understanding on strategic issues for the Alliance. But it is very important to, to be clear on one point, and that is that NATO's engagement with countries in the region is not about containing China, because these partnerships are aimed at promoting cooperative security and defending global norms and institutions which, which could contribute to the international rules-based order. With regards to NATO and China, what is the relationship um, between them and how is that handled? Well, um, we are having a political dialogue with uh, China uh, at the staff level. So that means that um, the Secretary General met with the Chinese Foreign Minister in Munich. I met with Chinese counterparts where we had, um, where we tried to explain the reason why NATO is looking at China right now. Um, also, you remember at the leaders meeting in London, leaders for the first time ever expressed the wish for NATO to look at China. So we are trying to get a better understanding of what China is doing and in terms of what does it mean for NATO. And that is why we have this continued exchange um, with China. Um, how does NATO see climate change risks? Hmm. Well, Climate change is something that NATO has to deal with in many ways. First of all, climate change is expected to be a source of instability in the future with scenarios which might be possible like flooded cities, um, drought, new and old infectious diseases, changing transportation routes, all of that will have an impact on Euro-Atlantic security. And then, of course, we have our operations and we have to take that into account as well. For instance, our armed forces, they, they need to think about energy savings, about fuel efficiency, um, about everything that sometimes is called green defense. Uh, more broadly, climate change is closely linked to the broader issue of NATO resilience to changing environments, which also could mean potentially preparedness for a pandemic as we experience currently, because we do not know what form the next pandemic, if something happens, will take. And then, of course, it is a topic that we always address in our discussions with other international organizations, as we are all affected. And that is also a topic that, that features more and more in our conversation with our partners. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary General. And thank you all for watching. Thank you.